Dorothea Bell, I'm the section head for landscape architecture, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Mader Bansky. Mader Bansky is a principal in the office of Michael Valkenberg Associates. Several of you, but not all of you, have met him earlier this afternoon when working on the Norton Gardens. Anyone who witnessed Matt wielding lo loppers or shears has realized that plants are red in his bones and also that he is to be reckoned with. Um, he has grown with plants and owns a nursery, taught plants and planting design at Harvard's Graduate School of Design for at least 15 years. 21. 21, there you go. <laughs> Bringing the knowledge of practice into academia and vice versa, which is an unusual combination. At MBVA, he has worked on seminal projects such as the Allegheny River Park in Pittsburgh, Teardrop Park in New York, and Brooklyn Bridge Park. I won't tell you where. As a designer, he is the ideal man to talk about plants to landscape architects and architects. As a plantsman, he is the ideal commentator on the process of design. That is designed not as a moment or an idealized representation, but rather as an evolving ideal. This afternoon, he illustrated how one revisits a design concept, walking through Norton Gardens and talking about limbs, growth patterns, plant character, and soil acidity. Now, he will present built projects through the lens of plants. This half day has been extremely rewarding for us. The gardens have received a good haircut, and that, like any good haircut, you don't really notice it, it just looks good. We have read and discussed what works and what did not, and what could work, and now Matt will talk about design. Make the most of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I have too many slides here. Um, and I'm not going to present the project per se. What I would like to do is I'd like to um, take you through a bunch of projects uh, that I've worked on, um, you know, over my time. Which, by the way, last week was 25 years that Michael had Baltimore Associates. So, yay! Um, and uh, and you know, kind of talk about concepts as they evolve, things that we were kind of playing with and um, got better or worse at and, um, and uh, you know, through the lens of some projects. So it's not so much a project description as it is trying to use these projects to illustrate some ideas. And that is, of course, that Rotea actually should be the one giving the lecture because she already encapsulated a lot of what I want to talk about. One, you know, I want to talk about a couple of things that we don't think too much about when we're first trying to learn about um, design and planning design, because there's so, there's so many facts to learn and there's so many, um, you know, uh, characteristics and we have to figure out what we like and all of that. And there's some intangible things that turn out to be probably more important than all of that stuff, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, detail in the end. And I think I'm going to try to focus on that. One of the intangibles is, is, is time and the concept of time and the evolution of the design over time and how it's sort of, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's not excusable for a landscape architect to not be considering that. Um, and, and that's sometimes difficult because we study art history and we think about these kind of idealized moments these kind of perfect pictures of things at some particular moment in time, and we don't realize that we're looking at something, you know, for an instant. And um, and you know, if, I'm sure, you know, how many people, have, how many times have you seen something in a history book or a magazine or whatever, and you've gone to have to see it in person, and and it's nothing like what you thought it was, right? It's nothing like the picture was, or or, or anything, and. Um, and so I think part of that being really conscious about that um, has been an obsession. I think because there's been so much important thought about that, so much important success in that regard. If you think about like, um, well, we think a lot about Olmsted in New York City because we have Central Park and we have Prospect Park, which I only live about a block away from. And one of the things that strikes me as the most profound about Homestead is how incredibly um, effective or, or uh, 
the, the parts are um, still. Um, and there, there's something about how we understood um, the needs of the user more than he, he had a vision, he had an artistic intent, but the intent was almost subjected to his uh, understanding of the needs of the, of the user. Um, it was almost uh, subsumed by that. And therefore, I feel like it's so much, it's so wildly successful. It's, you know, if you think about it, Central Park is the only thing in New York that functions exactly as intended 150 years later. Almost nothing does that in our modern society. You know, let's think, I mean, your phone will be outdated in, you know, a month or something. And, uh, and you know, you know, think about furniture trends or, you know, uh, every, you know, uh, what you do in particular buildings, it, it only lasts a, a little while. Um, but his parts function exactly as intended, and I think it's a lot of, of it is because it's, it's the kind of the receiver or the kind of recipient of the, of the artwork, if you will, is what's very well understood, you know, that process was very well understood. And, um, and I think John um, Gibson Hunt did our profession of, well, he's done a, a profession of great favor by being a historian of our profession, but his partic in particular, his, uh, his book um, about reception theory and landscape architecture is a real uh, open eye opener to me about how it really focuses. And this is hard for us because we're all working on building up our ego in school, right? And becoming like, so it's so important, artistic intention. My vision is so important. But what reception theory is about is, is about studying artworks not through the art, not like in your tra traditional art, art history uh, lens where you look at the art, artist's um, intent, right? It's all about how is the work received by different audiences throughout history, right? It's all about the reception of the work. And I think it's, it really was a literary, a form of literary study, but um, it's kind of, I think the application to landscape architecture is almost even more appropriate in a way. Um, so anyway, uh, so time I said, and then the other, the other intangible thing I think is, uh, that I want to focus on is craftsmanship and the involvement of, um, of uh, everything that happens after the design is finished and installed. You know, the kind of anticipating the whole process of maintenance or lack of maintenance or a particular abilities of, of the people that are going to be living with what we, what we make. Okay, so um, this was a very, this is Harvard Yard. Is that like, characteristics 
and their differences, and we focus a lot on their differences. And our idea for the replanting of Harvard Yard was to take the idea of, um, uh, kind of throw away the idea of a monoculture of elms, which seems to be not working, proven three times in a row, right? And make it into a more, uh, uh, a more genetically diverse collection of plants. But instead of necessarily expressing all of the individual characteristics of all of the individual trees that were bad for that um, complex planting, we had an idea that we would actually sub subvert some of the individual elevator trees and prune them in a similar way to elm trees. And an elm tree form is very similar to the way trees grow in the, in the woodland. And all of you that were out pruning with me on the north side of the building realized that all of those little dead branches on the bottom of the trees are because we had nursery grown trees where they encourage a lot of lateral branches to give them a kind of head to head, as they love to say, in the nursery tree. And, and now that we've put into uh, what's evolving into a woodland condition, and they have a lot of dead branches on the, on the bottom, so, so we were pointing those off. So here in Harvard Yard, you know, there is more individuality because, you know, they are different species, but there's a kind of uh, I would say uh, maybe unintuitive at first um, desire to suppress some of the individuality and prune the trees, limb them up as they say, and, and prune them in a more similar way uh, to be like elm trees. Um, so I think that was the other lesson I think of Harvard Yard is that there was a kind of evolving essence of Harvard Yard that by the time we worked on it I think it was something that you could try to figure out. You know, it, it actually spatially evolved over time. Um, but by the time, you know, soon for the 20th century or so, um, it really, it, 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 it had a certain number of kind of things that seem to, um, characteristics that seem to define it. Um, if, you, if you thought about it hard enough and you looked at it carefully enough, and then you could put them into words, and you could make diagrams about them, and things like that. So there was there were evocative phrases that we developed. We said that it had a New England austerity to it. In other words, there were trees, and there were grass. There wasn't a lot of flowering and stuff. There wasn't shrubs. There wasn't even any place to sit. And so the walls put these in. There was a kind of New England austerity. There was a kind of it was a kind of abstraction of the New England forest. Because of this forest form of the trees, which was the trees are actually further apart than they would be in the forest, so they can limbed up to kind of reinforce the forest form. There was um, there was actually a kind of dumb structure to it. The trees are roughly in kind of lines, but not like really rigid lines, kind of like farmerish kind of lines, like just walking along the line and planting the trees. And there's something really good about the lack of rigidity. So when a tree died, it didn't look like a missing tooth, right? So that was another thing. And then there were different spaces. There was what we call the honorific spaces, like the old yard here. And then there were garden scale spaces. And then there were um, uh, what we call uh, interstitial spaces. So we, we characterized the types of, the types of spaces. We talked about the form. We talked about the diagram. And, um, and then those became a bunch of things that would guide how this new um, canopy would be put in there. So that's sort of the lessons of Harvard Yard. This is uh, another one from the early 90s. This is the General Mills headquarters in Ontario, right? This is in Minnesota, where there's the Minnesota Prairie. But our project, do I have a laser camera up here somewhere? I can just point this way. I could do this. So our project was just a small installation here in the front. But what you can see is it's kind of a classic mid mid twentieth century modern um, for campus. Um, with just acres and acres and acres and acres and acres of long grass, and then a very nice corporate work collection. And so they bought a piece of sculpture, and um, and the sculptor said, "I don't want to be in." Uh, they 
they wanted to put it in front of the Gordon Von Schaff building here. And, uh, and he said, well, I don't want to be in that boring piece of grass like that. Why don't you hire a landscape architect to make a setting for my sculpture? So that was good luck for us. So we had an idea that we were going to make a Minnesota prairie garden right at the entrance of General Mills. And so this project, I think, conceptually um, and experientially, for me, was really the first time where we were working with a planting system instead of a kind of composition of plants. A prairie system, right? A kind of an relationship. And also where we really worked in collaboration with craftsmen that knew what they were doing in terms of growing and doing controlled burns and things like that. Um, Ron Bowen of a company called Prairie Restorations was the um, guy that did this. And, and, and so, I, so there was a lot to learn. And there's also um, another thing I think is important about this project is it's not a landscape restoration project, which for the first 10 or 15 years of explaining this project to people, they could not understand what I meant because it was, it was related to the Minnesota Prairie. So what's wrong with you? Why do you have river virgin every idiot? They're not in prairies. They're not fire tolerant species. And then I would say, but it's not a landscape restoration project. It's a prairie garden. It's a, it's a garden. It's a contrivance. Okay? Gardens are contrivance. Are contrivance. And this one is a contrivance on a lot of levels. For instance, it's ridiculously small. Right? Is a prairie only one and a half acres? No, that's not really a prairie, right? And also, because of the scale, we made the composition of the, of the grasses very simple, abstractly. Um, so there's actually only three varieties of grass-like plants. It was actually one of sedge. Pennsylvania sedge, which would grow underneath the trees. Prairie dropped a little, a little loose sedge. Those were three grasses. Three grasses, not like 30 grasses. Um, like Ron wanted to do, for instance, because he you know, knows a lot about grasses. And only three flowers that did not overlap in their flower sequence. First, you had lupins that were purple. Then, you had rough blazing star that was magenta. And then, you had uh, butterfly weed, a slightly tuberosa that was orange. So, then they turned from blue to magenta. Arm with no overlap, very contrived. Why? Well, because it is contrived. It's the front door to a corporate headquarters. This is not a little house on the prairie, right? And, uh, and, and the trees were a very, very important element for containing this thing. I call it a garden because it is contained, and I think the essence of a garden is containment. But some of the things that I learned about here is. is it is, first of all, the complexity of the system and the dynamic relationship with the wildlife, the importance of other senses besides the visual. We focus only on the visual, almost only on the visual. But, but in fact, guess what the really the other sense that was so present, you know, you were so conscious of when you walked through this garden? Can you guess what it is? Anybody? Who said it? Sound. Yeah, sound. The sound of the insects in the garden was an absolutely part of the aesthetic experience. Of course, the smell is too. And what you realize was that a green desert with mown grass around it was so lifeless, you couldn't, you know, even go back, right? I love this guy. Walking up through the middle of that. So it's like, what's, you know, what's going on in this one? I don't know. It's like, what the hell happened? By the way, the, the daring CEO that put this in, that encouraged us to do this, retired, and then another CEO took over, and he ripped this out because it was too. Uh, oops, what did I do? Because it was too uh, shaggy, I guess, or something. The trees were that, but all the prairie grass was bulldozed. But the, and then the other important thing, of course, is the, the incredible way that this thing registered the seasons in a much more 
um, you know, felt experience kind of way. That's the sculpture, by the way. Um, Mel Kendrick, that was the excuse. That's the rough blazing star. Okay, so that's kind of using a more complex system instead of a kind of just composition of your five favorite plants kind of thing, right? Then uh, another project from the early mid '90s was uh, this one. This is the new school courtyard. This is the only open space that the new school had in the middle of a block in New York City. And the original courtyard design that we replaced had one tree in it, which is. Um, a cliche. And the, uh, the the president of the new school had only one request was that there would be more than one tree <laughs> in what we replaced it with. So I think we kind of very adequately answered this request. We planted 80 trees in the same space. And so um, so why the hell did you do that? Um, well, um, what we realized, this is this is the kind of beginning of thinking about, well, what's it going to be like the first day, and what's it going to be like five years out, and what's it going to be like 20 years out, and what's it going to be like 50 years out, and can we make all of the experiences satisfying, maybe not all the same, but at least all satisfying. And so the, an idea of planning attrition was sort of um, starting to it was going on with key projects at the time, but this was one of the more explicit ones. And what's, what, what I mean by that is we would, we, we, um, we would plant too many quote-unquote trees, right? You can see it's a very used space. This is a kind of uh, typical event at the school looking down on it. Um, and, and now you can see in this picture there's considerably fewer trees in here. So. Back here is opening day, more or less, and this is later on. So, if there's, so the idea is, can we make something where there's a kind of partially anticipated chaos, right? Where we're going to set up a set of relationships between the plants and then we'll kind of like see what happens. And that was the idea here. These are just Yeah, they're all wild. You guys don't know what they look like, so I guess it's okay. Um, the, uh, uh, so the so the idea was um, to have an instant effect, a miniature forest at the beginning, and then have it evolve over time, and and think about the actual forest dynamic. You know, think about what you really see in nature in terms of what would happen. Over because how many times have you been on a field trip and you see a 20 by 20 foot area and it could have 200 white pine seedlings in it, right? And that same 20 by 20 foot area, 100 years later, would have one maybe white pine in it, go from 200 to one, that's a big change. It's a big change in, in everything about it. And so we kind of start to um, incorporate that dynamic into a design, make it part of the kind of intention, um, but also not totally fool yourselves into thinking you're going to know exactly what's going to happen either, right? So it's sort of, uh, it's sort of like playing with fire a little bit. The other thing that is important here is, uh, it's very important for you to understand how plants are produced in, in a commercial production. Um, in that, uh, you know, we go out and learn plants in, in a kind of ecological setting, and the way nature, you know, grew them and whatnot, and we kind of fall in love with our red cedars or our um, one thing or another. And then we realize, you know, when we start practicing, that half of that stuff is not available or available in that form. And we don't know why, and we're all confused and angry. And that's because there's a whole bunch of reasons why things are grown from the perspective of the farmer. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why things are done from the perspective of the contractor. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why things are done from the perspective of the gardener. And if you don't understand all those perspectives, 
You're just an ignoramus, basically. And, um, and so, also, understanding those things empowers you. So, one of the things I knew was that trees are grown from seed to make liners. And then the liners are sold. They're almost all grown in Schmidt Nursery in, in Oregon. <laughs> almost all of them. Um, and then they're shipped all over the country to different nurseries, bare root, and then they're grown up to several sides, little, you know, all, all, all over the place. And what you realize is, oh my God, those liners, they must cost nothing compared to the trees that I'm going to buy for, you know, several hundred dollars and they're going to cost several thousand dollars each when you plant them. So maybe what we can do is intervene in that process, pull trees out of that process earlier in the supply chain, if you will, and then kind of imitate what you might find in nature, a kind of competitive process between the younger plants. And that's what's going on here. So we put in a bunch of liner stock, basically, from a nursery. They only cost, I mean, these were, uh, they only cost a fifth of what um, specimen trees would have cost which is good because we put 80 of them, right? And you can see here they've been thinned out over time um, and, and that actually involved the, the manager of the place saying, hey, you want to come over and look at the courtyard? I think you could use a little more thinning. And we did. We would go over and teach young staff how to prune and thin out trees and, and, it, 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 and, and, they, and uh, then they cleaned up all the sticks for us. It sounds familiar, right? Um, and so that, this, is, this is kind of that idea, kind of learning about the supply chain, understanding. Now also you might just, another thing is empirical evidence is absolutely essential. Somebody was asking me, how do I design the riverfront park? And I didn't get to answer the question yet because I thought I would try in this thing. And, um, and I think the most important thing about how to design in any place whether it's a riverfront park or on a rooftop or, or anything, is go and gather empirical evidence. Go look at riverfronts that are not that are growing on their own. That that go see what's happening. Learn what the species are. Study the relationship between the trees and the water level. Look at um, uh, what, what what why are there sumac on the roof of this building? Because there are sumac on the top of a fort on an island off of Boston. That's why I brought sumac on top of the fort, because I noticed that sumac is a great thing for colonizing a place with kind of uh, thin soil and lots of sun and wind exposure. Okay? So empirical evidence is really, really important, especially when you're dealing with a challenging circumstance. You know, waterfront, salt, air exposure, uh, thin soil, extreme temperatures, windy, too sunny, too shady, whatever it would be. Oh, and so the point I wanted to make was why do we use red maple? Well, we use red maple because in our observation of the native forest, the only species that exists at the low slope community in the swamp, the low slope community, the mid slope community, and the hilltop community, the only one in all of them is red maple. But does the red maple look the same in all of them? No, it looks completely different. The red maple, which is the same genetic material at the bottom, are big, giant, trunk, big, uh, not in the swamp, they're a little kind of dead. But in the low slope community, they're big trunk trees with you know, two foot diameter trunks, tall, 60 feet high. On the top of the hill, they're natural bonsais. The little dwarf trees. But we knew that they could take the challenge of the kind of thin soil at the top and the competition. And so we were kind of hedging our bets there by using the red maple because it's kind of wide range of adaptability. Okay, so this is the project that they did with the architect of this building, Max Dobbin and Errol Lima. But this is a little less tiny, probably about the same proportional budget, but um, this is a uh, a factory in Georgia for Herman Miller at the time that uh, made, they were making office uh, 
uh, units, or you know those things, cubicles. Um, and uh, they wanted to make this factory on this hill in the middle of rural Georgia. And and you know there's no budget for a landscape on a factory. Okay, there's a budget for infrastructure, stormwater management, roads, parking lots. Okay, so that's what the landscape became. Um, it became uh, green infrastructure, and this is sort of one of the first projects. This is also from the late '90s, where we started to do that. What you're seeing here is the factory, which is the L shape, and then. Um, an idea of taking the parking lot and instead of making it just one giant rectangle, start to cut it up and then make a series of wet, constructed wetlands that would march up in between and become the thing that came and kind of uh, added some uh, diversity of experience to you know the factory workers as they're kind of walking into the factory and out every day. So this was an early a concept sketch of that is actually a collage with cardboard and paint and, and stuff like that. And this idea that the parking lot would start to break up and then the marshland would start to uh, invade itself in, into that system um, is shown here. And this is the actual thing. Um, and again, no budget, there's no budget for this, almost no budget. So there's lines of little wine stock trees, that sounds like a clean in for now, right? Little wine stock trees that went in along the edges. And then it's kind of, this is basically grading what you can see. And then it's all interconnected as a kind of hydraulic system. So, you know, the, the, the relationship between the plants and the water regime that would control the plants in those, in those spaces. And, uh, you know, some more pictures. <clears throat> okay, so, yes, this is in here. It was a question of whether Allegheny Riverfront Park is in here. So, um, this is a Allegheny Riverfront Park in Pittsburgh, another kind of super challenging environment. And, uh, you know, basically the park on the be two, two places, an upper level park, and a lower level part. Um, and the thing I want to say about this, well, first of all is, you know, just because you're looking at a site on a nice day doesn't mean it's always a nice day on that site. And, um, you know, this is what could happen down there when the water goes up 20 feet. And um, not only barges maybe go into your landscape, but also, giant ice cakes the size of railroad cars that can share all three and one out. This happened in the middle of the construction documents. That was enough to scare you. Um, so when I went to the site, this is what it looked like. I drove out, I got out there and pulled back to the office and Michael says, the house is site. I said, uh, it needs work. <laughs> So, one of the things that we did here was change uh, some of the infrastructure of this in order to get this to work. We brought walkways out around this, ramps down to connect. We also moved the roads on top in order to make space there as well. But the main thing I want to talk about is this idea of empirical evidence again, of kind of going and looking at what would work. That's a pretty scary place given that slide I showed you at the bar, right? We put trees in. We really want something that was going to work. And so what we wound up doing were uh, floodplain trees. Where did we figure out what the species were? Upstream. That's what we figured it out. We looked up, we took a boat ride and we went upstream and we saw what was growing. And what we realized also was that river birds, for instance, which is the predominantly but also popular the red and, and red maple, river birds, if they are sheared off, what will they do? Everybody know? They'll just sprout from the from the broken off stump. But they're also what will they do? They'll bend over and then come back up again. They're flexible as well. Why? Because they're called river birch, right? They grow in the in the floodplain. They're adapted to that kind of environment. And so um, and then kind of protect the crowns of those trees. We wound up putting giant boulders all through here, which would also become kind of 
prompt you seated because a cute little Victorian bench would not stand up too well to a big ice, iceberg coming down there, would it? it well, this floods every year, not 20 feet, but at least four or five feet a couple of times a year on the lower level. And then on the upper level, it's more informed by the kind of classic civic landscape, the kind of tree that's always the marker of the civic landscape, the London plane tree, bluestone, which is very common in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> this is just kind of building that out. You can sort of see the infrastructural move here with the canopy between. The big, this is bluestone chunks on the top of kind of refined bluestone on the bottom, just giant chunks of bluestone. And then notice how big the trees are when we put them in. Why? Well, because they were liner stock. Why would you use liner stock? Because you want younger trees to hold that better to reflect than um, uh, specimen trees. So also, they were small. And so what could you do? Well, you could plant them between the rocks. It was just very easy. Also, we wanted a lot of them, and they're much more affordable that way. You know, then that kind of grows out like this. And so the interplay of, of the trees with each other that you see in nature, that you don't see in, in, in specimens that you buy in a nursery, which all look like they were punched out of a factory assembly line, right? Where they're actually trying to make them that way. They're spending a lot of energy and time trying to make them look like an industrial product. Uh, you might not want that, right? Well, how do you avoid that? Well, one way is to is to use the natural template and let the trees um, fight it out with each other. So another landscape that was informed um, by uh, and, and plant communities that were informed by the idea of water flowing over and through the landscape is this uh, water treatment facility, uh, the drinking water treatment facility in uh, Connecticut. And um, the idea Stephen Hall and his team of architects had for the building was that it would be a didactic experience, that it would be a kind of piece of civic architecture and that you could take uh, grade school kids there and they could learn about this complicated chemical process that they use to um, treat the water. Okay, it would be kind of go through an, an, an architectural promenade through the building. And so, um, so the concept of the landscape turned out to be very similar, but more of a landscape related um, way of dealing with it. Because the regional water authority, which runs this, their actual, their biggest responsibility is watersheds, is maintaining. Um, watersheds because that's where the water gets into the reservoirs, that's surrounding the reservoirs, and then that's what's, um, you know, their source material, obviously. So uh, the idea extended from inside the outside was to say, well, why don't we make this into a microcosm of a watershed of Connecticut? And we'll start in the mountain, and we'll have agriculture, and we'll have some streams and valleys, and we'll end up in the reservoir at the bottom. And so that's what wound up shaping this. This is the lowest price per square foot project we ever did. Why? Because it's a water treatment plant. Do you think they have a budget for a landscape on a water treatment plant? It's about the same as they have for a furniture factory. Very little. This cost five dollars a square foot. Not the fifty point point on it, but the high line cost seven hundred dollars a Um, so here it is in the context. Um, this is what was there before, so Stephen's idea of kind of a bridge with an underground building was kind of there already and kind of redid it in a neat way. But, um, there was a big concrete box there with sand in it that they filtered the water before. It was for 100 years that worked just fine. By the way, it's covered with grass and it was 100 years old, so so much for green roofs being a new idea, right? So this is what that site was um, before. That's the big box. They graded it here and all here. 
And then this is what we did with that in the end. And so, you can, so one of the things that we were doing with all of this land here shaping was disposing of six stories of underground building, the volume for six stories of underground building. Because the uh, RWA had agreed to, with the neighborhood, that they weren't going to truck any dirt off the site because that would be too many trucks in the neighborhood. And that turned out to be a great thing for us because then we got all this material to work with. It's sort of like Mr. Knowlton insisting that this building have be made out of marble and then the architect's coming up with the most incredibly creative solution to a marble building. I'm sure it's not what he had in mind, but it's pretty spectacular. Um, so, the, uh, so you can kind of see this kind of sense of flow and movement down through the landscape there. And so it, it, you get a set, a set of um, microecologies that are created by the intersection of grading and water um, and soil. Uh, and it comes out of really just earthwork and planting. And so a whole set of kind of types, if you will, are, are created through that, just that simple set of uh, inter, you know, interaction between plants and grading and water. And you know, starting to play with different kinds of um, uh, archetypes, if you will, like a pen peninsula and the pond and the lake edge. Um, and they become these kind of defining experiences. The other thing that we got to work with here in terms of planting systems was um, uh, an engineering, pond edge engineering system called bioengineering. This is a, a kind of structural system and it uses plants as a structural element in soil stabilization of wet, wet environments. It was mostly developed in Germany. Um, and what you can see here is the use of cocoa fiber uh, logs, which are called fascines, and then um, uh, dormant uh, cuttings that are also inserted in between the fascines. And that gives us this kind of uh, temporary structure that will then be taken over by the plants. This is the pond drained down before. And you can see here just growing in, growing in some more. Um, this unfortunately was opening day, and that's me looking at it on opening day. Because with a very low budget, build it, a very, very low budget project, you don't have money for instant gratification. And it did take a little while for it to grow in, um, but it has. Uh, <clears throat> one other thing, we were talking about soil pH today, and I was talking about how if you dig down into the ground, you get into more carbonates and a higher pH and more alkaline soil. So this is in Connecticut where the native surface soil is, you know, six, six or so, pH is six, five point five maybe. Um, I didn't know that thing about carbonates being down and down and down below, below, below the surface until after I finished this project. Um, and, uh, so once we got done spreading soil from 60 feet down all over the site, um, we realized that we had a pH of 8.5 instead of 5.5. And our native Connecticut landscape was really doing poorly <laughs> in that 8.5 pH. You just need one, well, it looks good here and in a lot of places it does, it did, but some things just petered right out um, because they really needed the acidity for the nutrient availability. Um, it was a, a, a editing process by pH, um, but still it has a kind of lushness to it. It also had an extensive green roof. Um, Wellesley um, College uh, is uh, an incredible campus where the uh, the campus was reinvented by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. around 1910 or so, 1915. 
Uh, and what he uh, essentially told Wellesley to do, because Wellesley was, is still, was a girl's school, women's school. And what did that mean in those days? And it still does, even though masters are not still a women's school, they still have their one big building in the middle. They have more buildings now, but they had uh, one big building. And everything happened in one big kind of manor house kind of style. Uh, of, uh, of academic architecture, where you, you ate and you went to class and you and, uh, slept and uh, socialized. Everything happened in one big building. Well, at Wellesley, that one big building burned down in 1915, and they had an opportunity to reinvent the campus. And Olmsted Jr., to cut to the chase, told them, you know, you have this incredible kettle and cane landscape, little hills and little Dales that are part of this post-glacial um, condition, and these things are being lost all over New England right now because they're a great source of gravel for the Industrial Revolution. And it would be really neat if you could make a campus that was shaped by the natural form of the land. It would be practical. You wouldn't put buildings in low spots where they would flood. You would we could accentuate the high spots with the architecture. He basically described landscape urbanism about 100 years before anybody else. Um, and that's what they did, more or less. So you could see this was the topography. And these building patterns more or less follow the Olmsted Jr.'s direction of kind of working on the tops of the little hills and keeping the low valleys open. They had started to make a, a kind of orthogonal quad right up here, and there was a revolution um, in the faculty, because they were going to just draw an axis straight down to the river and flatten it all out, or straight down to the lake and flatten it all out, but they didn't wind up doing that in the end. So our project that we also did with Max Falcon and Merrill Elon was to make a place for the campus center, which is here, this is the garage for it. And that would be a kind of a landscape outlined here on the campus. And our, we had done a master plan for Wellesley and learned all about what Olmsted Jr. had said about it. And what we realized was a, the, there was this kind of fabulous low-lying valley system that created the kind of structure of the campus, not a diagonal structure. And um, they more or less didn't put buildings in that structure. But then over here, they kind of lost their way. And they had a coal gasification plant. And they filled it in. And they put a surface parking lot in. And, and it kind of got not so good. And so our idea was that they should restore that to this valley system and make that the setting for the new campus center, which we thought would be right here. So this is what it was before. This is kind of hard to believe, but that's actually the art museum. This is a power plant, and this was a 200-car parking lot. And this is what it looked like after one season of growth after we uh, reclaimed that area. And so what I, what I want to talk about here in terms of a planting concept was, again, shaping the whole landscape um, to be informed by the way water and energy moves through the landscape function on a very technical infrastructural level. And it became quite technical because there was a brownfield site here. And we built a, a wetland over the brownfield site. In nature, when you see an elevated wetland, you call it a perched wetland. We built a constructed perched wetland over a brownfield site where there, there are, there's a system of, in place where they continue to extract um, organic solvents that are in the ground there. But also our site, which is over here, we imagine could start to serve a much larger part of the campus than was there, uh, that was within the site, and, and, and could help to preserve the water or improve the water quality in Lake Wabin, which is a, a state protected uh, great pond, as they call it. So the entire shape of this landscape is informed by 
the way water flows over and through and, and into and around and then out to the, to the pond. This is um, it, it under construction, obviously, and a similar view to that um, parking lot view I showed you earlier. This is called the marsh feeder pond. It's where the water enters the system from off the site and also on the site, and then it overflows into a cattail marsh, which filters the water, then goes down a small waterfall because it's elevated, perched wetland, and then into Lake Wabin. This is it um, growing in. This is that marsh feeder pond. This is the cattail marsh, and this is how it goes out. It becomes, of course, an incredibly important borrowed landscape for the campus center, um, which is truly one of the, it's the second, maybe I'll say it's the second best building McNamara ever did. Uh, I, it's sort of a battle in my mind between these two, these two totally different incredibly specific buildings, but anyway, um, that's the campus center there. That was the view out. So these are some little bit more recent pictures. <clears throat> um, next project I'd like to talk about is Teardrop Park, which is in Battery Park City. This is an older picture of Battery Park City when the Twin Towers clearly are still there. And, um, and the northern part wasn't quite finished. And I would, this slide is acknowledging the admiration we had for Susan Child's um, South Cove, which was here, and this is her um, project there, where she started to think about, she started to um, play with the idea of, of a kind of constructed nature and civic landscape kind of combined together. The program for Teardrop was to be a children's play space of some sort, um, which was a curious or challenging um, request from the client because they had just finished making a kind of state-of-the-art traditional playground right here, right next to it, which of course turns out to be great, but then we didn't have to do that. Um, and uh, I, this, this slide is about um, some of the form one of the important formative um, uh, forces in kind of laying out the space was to study where the sun would be at different um, times of the year and to determine therefore where some grass could be because we wanted some grass because everybody in New York wants some grass. Nobody has any grass. They will live in these lousy little apartments with no grass. Grass is really important. They want grass. But how are you going to do it in that canyon of buildings? So a kind of very scientific study. This is showing where the sun would be at different times of the day on the equinox. And this is the project where the kind of intense relationship between the craft people that were going to take care of the project and the conception of the project really started to become dovetailed. Okay? Because Battery Park City is a kind of garden city made down at the tip of Manhattan, created by an act of the state legislature, and they're able to collect their own grants and put the money back into Battery Park City. And one of the things they've done with that is they created the best parks department in the country, I think. Um, called the Battery Park City Parks Conservancy, where they've created an entirely organic-based uh, maintenance program. They have adequate uh, gardeners, um, and they really care for the landscape. Of course, knowing that the landscape is sort of their marketing tool. Um, it's, they've got 30 acres of, of landscape there. So this, this garden is only 1.9 acres. Um, but, uh, or, uh, I call it a garden, it's not really a garden, it's a park, but it kind of, it kind of uh, had a challenge created by the urban design pattern. This, these four buildings were part of the original plan, but when we got to the site, there was actually a road through here, and the intention was to make two private gardens for the buildings on either side. But Battery Park City decided that they'd rather make it a park and a public space for kids and adults. And 
And that was a big challenge because how do you take something that's so bounded like this and make it feel like a public landscape? Well, one of our ideas was that a robust naturalism is a symbol of a public landscape in New York because that's what Olmsted embraced when he based his landscapes on the Catskills. Central Park is kind of modeled on the Catskills. And, um, and, and another funny thing happened, which was the, the president of Battery Park City, um, who was a uh, upstate New York Teddy Roosevelt Republican, said, I grew up in the country, and the country was good for me, and I wanted to make a piece of the country for the kids of New York City. And you can think to yourself, how is that so stupid? That sounds so dumb. But uh, then you check yourself and realize, oops, that's exactly what Olmsted said. He said exactly the same thing. That a kind of robust naturalism is a great place, a great platform for a civic meeting ground, a public space, ironically, he concluded that. Not a plaza, not, a, uh, not the Tuileries Gardens, uh, but a robust naturalism. And in fact, he actually had the exact same reference landscape. They both were talking about the castles. And believe me, he, he, he wasn't a student of Olmsted, so anyway, there's something to say about for twi intuition. So the other thing that you can see here, uh, I think as a concept uh, in the plan is the containment of the space was so strong that if you walk into it and you could see, you can understand the extent of the space, you, your interest would immediately wane. You have no more interest in it. It'd be kind of like walking into an empty room or into a room uh, where you kind of um, see the whole thing and that's it. And so our idea became how can we use topography and planting to basically prevent you from understanding the whole? Yeah, how many times do you think about a concept where your whole idea is legibility? It's all about I want to make people understand the form or the shape or the intention here. This is a kind of unintuitive idea in a way um, where we want to prevent them from understanding the whole. Because that leads to a kind of psychological state which I think Bachelard described as um, a condition of boundlessness where you can't conceive of the whole and therefore your mind can't focus on any one thing and it gives some space for your imagination to run around in, which is clearly an idea that Olmsted was playing with, maybe without the same fancy language, but similar. And so there's a, uh, a real embrace of complex complexity in this project, and what this is is the soil plant. That's how many different kinds of specific soil mixes there were in order to support a whole collection of <coughs> microecologies that would add an intense amount of complexity to the space. And so there's this, for instance, this marsh garden, which is about as big as the space down here at the base of the, of the, of the, of the stage here. Um, but to these kids, it could be you know, a vast wilderness. Um, and there's little paths that curve up to mountains, quote unquote, that are 12 feet high. Um, and an immense amount of program is actually folded into this space because of the complexity of the form, which allows for all kinds of impro improbable juxtapositions. The thing about the planting, though, is you cannot do a Castro planting, in fact, in between two buildings on the water, in between four buildings on the waterfront in Battery Park City. Because you probably know that we have waterfront plants or prairie plants, and they're adapted to wind and sun, right? But no shade, which you have in the buildings. Or you have plants that are adapted to shade that grow in the woods, but what aren't they adapted to? 
lots of wind and sun, right? And so the kind of abstraction of the Catskill landscape it had to become a kind of um, a real careful selection of things that were really going to be able to work within this extremely difficult set of, of ecological conditions that were created by the macro and microclimate of the area, um, especially by the shade of the buildings, which are like 30 plus stories high. Um, and this is, no, anyway. Okay, uh, another uh, project here for campus, also with Mac and Merrill. Uh, this is their third best building. This is the Gates Science Center uh, for Carnegie Mellon. And uh, the, this was, an, again, a very, very challenging site. And the answer to the challenge, again, is to embrace complexity in terms of the planting solution and the topographic solution. The idea here, well, the challenge here is that this site was entirely the backyards of every building all the way around here. The main streets of Carnegie Mellon, if you've ever been in there, is not shown in this plan. There's a big grand alley here, there's a big grand alley here. And these are the backs of all of the buildings. So this was a five acre leftover space that had 90 feet of grade change and six loading docks besides the one of the building that we had to deal with. And there, because of all the grade change, there were bridges and uh, entrances to the building at, four, at three or four or five different levels. And so one of the decisions was to not use a single retaining wall anywhere because it sounds like there's enough built things in this space. Um, and by shaping and um, uh, using a lot of geo, geo, um, uh, geotechnical engineering, we made a kind of uh, a shape landform that created all these kind of microclimatic environments where with varying moisture, shade, wind, sun, and gave us an, an, an intense amount of different microenvironments and different, therefore, plant communities. I'm not expecting you to see all those. I'm just trying to show you how many there were. And so um, here also was the idea of a winter garden, sort of like you guys have on the south side of, of the building. And you're talking about a bunch of, uh, you know, computer nerds that are not going to necessarily go out in the middle of a cold, cold Pittsburgh winter. So the idea of a kind of winter garden um, of witch hazel and, and uh, other plants that would look interesting in the winter um, then spills down into a really a kind of a more different exposure. Um, and then here's a little tiny rain garden woven into that. I don't have any good pictures of this. These are all like taken with iPhones and whatnot. <clears throat> this is a picture that my client took um, with his iPhone, so that's why it's all blurry. I just, I like it when a client sends you a picture. Um, so, that's all about just earth plants and water, that, that project, and creating an incredible amount of variety of human manipulation of those three those three mediums. Um, in terms of, a, a I want to talk about just the planting concept of uh, this, this section of Hudson River Park. We worked on this segment from here to here. Um, one section we call uh, Chelsea Cove is a combination of three piers. This one, one parallel to the shore, and this one, and then the upland, what they call the upland area. And uh, one of the uh, challenges of, of Hudson River Park, if you've been there, is that it's very linear and it's very episodic with kind of old abandoned piers that have been reclaimed as um, waterfront parks. And we saw as an opportunity here the ability to maybe make, combine these things formally into more than one or individual expression and how to balance out with the desire to have a lot of different programs as well. And the concept that came out of very early study models, these are made of the paper and cardboard that we use in public meetings, 
was this idea of this embracing grove of trees that would sweep from pier to upland and back out onto the pier and kind of formally tie all of these things together. And you could see that idea reiterated in different things as the programs kept changing and evolving. And this is the uh, build project, and you can see that idea of that kind of embracing grove is, is retained all the way until the end. Um, so it has a central lawn, and the kind of trees kind of sweep out onto a pier, which goes up in the air for the hell of it, and then back around behind you, and then out onto the other pier. So, um, and some of the shaping of this lawn which again was contorted in order to prevent you from having a kind of total conception of it, because it's actually, again, ridiculously small, like everything in New York. Um, you can see that kind of does work here. You kind of the, can't understand the kind of extent of the, of the space. Um, and this is, this, is the other, this is the pier where it com comes out of. That grove of trees then kind of engulfs fair, fair, several programmatic elements, including a kind of entry garden, a skateboard park, a carousel, and then a kind of promenade out at the end of this pier. So you kind of go from uh, this kind of thing where people are having, you know, a nice calm little lunch together, to people exercising, to uh, I, 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 I wouldn't want to call them kids, since many of them are in their 40s, they look like. Uh, over here, skateboarding, all, all in an incredibly close quarters. And, and the other thing I want to say about, I think, landscape as a medium, and planning particularly, uh, that I think is illustrated, for instance, in this picture, is you can achieve a really improbable juxtapositions between elements. It sort of, it shows the falsity of kind of uh, zoning in a way. Uh, that these kind of almost incongruous programmatic elements can kind of exist in such close proximity if kind of handled well in terms of the planting and the grading and the kind of thinking through the relationships between the different people. So this is that entry garden. And then and as you move out, you get out to this, uh, this is out at the end of that pier. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, an ongoing project uh, right now. It's called the 606, or also was earlier called the Bloomingdale Trail, which you might have heard of. This is in Chicago, and it's a kind of um, making an elevated abandoned rail uh, line, which you can see here, into a linear park for um, this neighborhood in Chicago. It's 2.7 miles long, goes from Wicker Park to Logan Square, which can sort of be summarized as from gentrification to not gentrified yet. Um, and you can see its relationship, the Humboldt Park here and the Humboldt Parkway. Um, and this is Grand Park and Millennium Park uh, is probably something you know that's over here. One of the things that uh, you really want to understand, and I've been talking about this indirectly, are what are the kind of major moves that start to set up the kind of ecologies of your site, and how can you work with them? And seeing these historic images of the Bloomingdale Trail, uh, the Bloomingdale Line, as it was called, and that's because it was down Bloomingdale Avenue, just so you know, um, was built in this kind of monumental architecture uh, engineering massive gravity walls. So these are two giant gravity walls that were then filled in between to create this elevated rail line and then it's interrupted by bridges that go over the streets. Everybody understand that? So there was a kind of heroic nature to this um, but also a kind of ecological condition that was created by this kind of raised section of earth and it makes it totally different than a high line too which is essentially a bridge, right, on legs. This is essentially filled between two massive gravity walls. And what dawned on us at, um, and these are the bridges, what dawned on us in, in, is that we, in turning this thing from this kind of monofunctional um, uh, 
you know, uh, non-accessible uh, uh, infrastructural element into a kind of polyfunctional, uh, open to everyone public amenity, uh, we needed to transform it somehow. There needed to be some kind of transformation, but we also wanted to kind of work with what was there too and started to really think about that volume of soil that was in there and what it offered. And what, what, what we realized it offered was a grading opportunity that we first of all needed to get off of, up, up, off of up here, right? So dipping down was a good idea practically. But also, it was very monotonous ecologically, right? And it was also very monotonous um, experientially. The monotony of a, of a trail like this is, is your biggest enemy. Uh, although you have the kind of you have the interest of the changing city around it, the trail itself is you know the more immediate experience. So we realized we could start to regrade this, create different ecologies through grading, and also different spatial experiences. And this was a conceptual sketch that we did that illustrated that idea of, of dipping and shaping and revealing the structure as well, which we thought was a kind of cool, um, a bold structure, so you can see that idea of the dipping there. And we started to talk about all of the kind of a variety of cross-sections that you could start to have, um, many of which we, we are doing, especially this one where you kind of cut down in between. So it becomes a series of segments that then need some differentiation beyond what you can get out of the grading, which has its own practical limitations. And, and so the idea of planting as the real player in terms of creating the variety of experience, of course tied to the grading, becomes the engine for design here, because this had to be a bike lane and, met, and match AFSCO standards, kind of, you know, federal standards, because there was federal money paying for um, a good portion of this. And so um, this idea of here creating a kind of mount covered with a, a native grasses that gives you a kind of prospect to look down the length of the trail at the entry. And then I'm not going to show you the whole design, but um, just a couple of things to illustrate this idea of variety through planting. Where you often is in, this is one of the wider sections, we often don't have this much room to move around in our tight fitting, loose fitting straight jacket. <coughs> But you can see this idea of a kind of poplar grove here, creating a strong kind of spatial experience that would be then different than the openness of this space than, the, than is then different than this space here. And so this is that space, um, which in this case was 60 feet wide, most of the trail is only 30 feet wide. And then this idea of this punctuation uh, of the space through different strong, graphic, memorable, Planting, element, uh, planting moments are here where um, an overlook that overlooks that avenue I told you about becomes a moment for um, using smoke tree, which is a kind of a small tree uh, that will, has incredible fall color and very bizarre flowers that look like smoke that becomes this kind of moment um, along this here uh, at that there again different than the rest. Um, this is, doesn't have anything to do with planting, this is just cool, I'm showing you. The, uh, the engineers uh, are recycling a bridge and re from the other end of the trail and putting it in here, taking these legs out. And then our idea was to cut right through the old abutments here and cut down the walls on the opposite side of this to extend the sidewalk right through. That's the recycled bridge. And we cut down as you can see, cut one of the walls down on one side to open up the inside of the structure so you can zigzag up and over this major boulevard here. Well, and that's it. Before they cut the walls through, those are, those are now cut through. Um, and uh, again, using the idea of planting to connect spaces on either side of the trail, this is an opportunity to make what we call an access park. Um, and, uh, uh, you could also see the, the bridge uh, where they put trusses, they're going to put trusses over the existing girder here and remove the legs to open it up underneath. Um, but then this idea of this kind of landscape of columnar trees 
that stitches the two sides together and becomes a kind of signal along this main Milwaukee Avenue of this kind of civic uh, landscape that, that is present there. Or here where the kind of um, um, another existing park, they could uh, take a little better care of their parks in Chicago, I think. Um, where the idea of uh, the, the landscape kind of spills down and creates a kind of seamless connection when we cut the wall down here as well. And then find uh, at the end, um, this major uh, avenue becomes blocked uh, where the trail curls around back on itself. They remove this bridge and used it on Western Avenue like I showed you. And then it becomes a big piece of um, green infrastructural sound, a green infrastructural sound, kind of using uh, precast concrete we use along highways and planting it all in roses. How much further should I go? Any questions? Should I just buzz through Brooklyn Bridge Park fast and then do that? Okay, I'll do that. Um, so Brooklyn Bridge Park is, um, uh, I'm just going to go straight to the planting concepts for Brooklyn Bridge Park, but it's basic one, basically 1.3 miles long if you measure along the road. This is the Brooklyn Bridge. This is the Manhattan Bridge. That's Lower Manhattan. That's the Statue of Liberty. This is Governor's Island. It starts down here at Atlantic Avenue. And this, this is a drawing of the full extent of the park, but it's almost an actual depiction of the park at this point in time, in terms of its extent. You know, what we were starting with um, is a kind of post-industrial condition with elevated highway here and lots of heavy infrastructure. Um, and the question of, with something of this massive kind of change is what you ask yourself, well, what, what do you keep and what do you change? It's sort of like that's the fundamental question. You're not going to tabula rasa a site like this, and you're not going to keep it all because it's made for unloading boats and honestly a little boring once you get over the view. Um, and one of our concepts was born out of a kind of close reading of the structural capacity of the site where the piers became places for thinner, flatter landscapes. And then the upland areas became places for topographic, thicker landscapes that they could also help us deal with little problems like this, which are, is called the BQE, or Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So that cross-section is illustrated here where we wound up raising and making elevated land, which turns out to be really good for raising trees up out of uh, salt inundation. But then designing it with sound engineers to make it an effective sound reducing landform, half of which has been built and I have to tell you it's very, very effective. This became, that becomes an opportunity for a wildscape all along the back of that here where no normal sane human being would want to be, uh, and, but birds would like. And that becomes this kind of linear um, uh, bird sanctuary along the back that people that are up in the Brooklyn Heights Promenade can look down on. There's an idea about water recycling that I won't go into. So the challenge of this site is that it's very long and thin and actually doesn't have a lot of land. It's 85 acres um, of actual land, uh, or and that even includes some of the water areas. So it's maybe 72 acres of land, half of that is is actually on structured deck. So Central Park is 840 acres or something like that. But what we do have is a gigantic borrowed landscape that makes it even, of course, bigger than Central Park. But how do you deal with that? And the site was extreme, you know, one way of describing what it was was extremely simplified ecologically, right? An industrial site. They're not interested in ecology, of course. They're interested in flat surfaces for trains to go on and unload boats and whatnot, move trucks around on. So one way of thinking about it is it was extremely simplified. So how do we add um, complexity to it and start to create a variety of experiences through the creation of a series of microecologies by manipulation of the shoreline, manipulation of the landform, inviting water into the site, projecting out into the water, 
create, working with the basic ecological factors that create microclimate, shade, wind, water, soil, elevation, and start to create that series, uh, a series of, of diverse microecologies, which we then started to call different types that we made up funny names for, some of which seem sort of normal and some of which are just kind of funny. So, um, the other thing that, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what those are in a second, but the other, the other thing that we started to realize was that there was a scale problem. That what we really wanted on an exposed, sunny, windy site like this was shade, because it, you could get a third degree burn just walking from one end to the other if you didn't have it. Uh, but you also want grass. Like I already told you, New Yorkers want grass. They want to actually get a third degree burn sometimes. And also, it's fun to picnic on and stuff like that. But how do you make grass and trees together on such a narrow site? If you haven't noticed, trees grow, right? Trees start out like as big as me, and then eventually they're as big as this building, right? They change by 20 times, 30 times in size. They go from six feet high to 60, 100 feet high. How do you deal with this crazy, unpredictable, well, sort of predictable, but this ridiculous scale change? It's, it's like one of the most preposterous things, actually, that landscape architects have to deal with. I always illustrate the point by pointing out that when you go to Crate and Barrel to buy a couch, which you already have a little bit of scale confusion about because it's all displayed in beautiful loft-like spaces, right? And you forget that you have an apartment that has no room that's bigger than 12 by 12. And, uh, and so you buy a couch and you bring it back to the apartment and it's too big by four inches, and it's a complete and total disaster. You have to have them come back and take it away, right? Your couch is too big by four inches, and it's a total disaster. How about all your design elements changing by 30 times in size? That's a little bit more radical, a scale change uh, challenge. So what we developed was an idea of using hedgerows that would then preserve, that would provide um, corridors, of, they would fir fir first of all start to tie together these disparate elements with lines. Lines are a nice formal element for tying things together. And then they would form sh corridors of shade, which you need, but then they wouldn't be scattered all over the lawns, which people think are big, but they're not really very big. So we started to think about the landscape over time. And this concept of plain attrition that I told you about all the way back at the new school. And what's it going to be like today you planted it? And what's it going to be like 75 years later? And which trees are going to survive? I don't know. Maybe there's maybe the maybe there'll be another bug that will wipe out one whole species. Maybe there won't be. Who knows? How are you going to plan for it? Well, start to think about a kind of going from a lot of small trees to maybe a lot fewer big ones and make a, a system that works with that. So this is right after planting, immediately after planting the hedgerows, which became something that's, you know, an abstraction or something that you find in, in the rural landscape. They have a lot of heterogeneity to them. Um, actually not that much, but some. And, uh, and then, you know, this is the first season. So they're not quite shading this yet, but come on, it's the first season. Uh, and then the lawns are then maintained as open, so the views to the Statue of Liberty and back to the Brooklyn Bridge and whatnot uh, are maintained uh, in perpetuity. What, happened, what would happen if we took the trees and scattered them all over the grass? It would be kind of cool the first year because everyone could like huddle underneath each tree and have a picnic, but 20 years later, what would you have? Dirt. That's what you would have. Like you have in so many parks, you have you'd have dirt because the trees would grow up and shade out the grass. And then what, what else would they would do? They would show you how ridiculously small those lawns are because now you have actual full size, full scale trees in them, and you would be able to understand how small they were. So here's starting to grow out um, some more a little bit. And one of the things that we did was we. we um, again, understanding the production of trees and the mechanics of it and the concerns, 
We um, custom grew multi-stem trees for the hedgerows because the trees were only in the hedgerows. We thought, wouldn't it be nice to have more stems? And wouldn't it be neato anyway? So these are multi-stem London plane trees that are created by the farmer by taking three liners that he got from Schmidt Nursery, of course, and put them together in the same hole and grew them up for several years for us, which he did totally at his own risk, by the way, because this was a public bid job. He's also, you know, pretty smart and realized that there's not going to be too many other nurseries with the specified multi-stem London plane trees of the correct cultivar. So, you know, he did get the sale in the end, too. Um, but totally at his own risk. So several of those planting um, communities that I didn't quite go through with you, but one of the other types that we thought we could engage here was this idea, an idea of managed succession, which you could kind of say was started up on the top of the noble school, right? This idea of managing um, a dynamic old field landscape, because our thought was, well, first of all, this is what happens when you abandon an industrial site, the old field landscape starts to take over the sumac and the uh, and the uh, bayberry and all of those kinds of things. And the funny thing is, most parks don't have any of that in it. Why don't they have any of that? Because it's just a temporary landscape. It grows out, it goes away, it becomes a nurse crop for the more permanent trees. So how could we kind of keep all of this vibrancy and dynamism of, of a successional landscape in a park. How could you design that into the park? Well, we could plant areas that way, and then we can make a park maintenance program that says you're going to go in and cut down those plants when they get to be a certain caliber. So that's the idea. Of course, and, and that happens in zones like this here, and in here, and in here. So that the, uh, the only thing, the only shortcoming to planning growth in Bridge Park is there was no park manager of the park when we were doing it. We had to substitute for that by imagining what they would want based on our experience of working with other skilled people and also then reviewing it with those other skilled people. But we had no idea what the personality of the head of horticulture was going to be and whether the idea that we would cut down perfectly healthy trees could possibly compute in their mind. Most people that focus on growing plants have a little bit of a hard time with the idea of randomly cutting down plants. And um, whether Rebecca can bring herself to do it, I think is still to be seen. Um, maybe she says she likes the idea conceptually. Um, this is that meadow on the back of, of, the, of the hill there that I mentioned earlier. That's just a picture of my daughter that I looked at the slideshow. Um, this um, and another set of types that we have here are a series of water gardens that are again green infrastructure um, and a series of uh, water gardens that filter water, that move it into cisterns, and then is used for, for um, uh, irrigation in the park. The plan engineered plan projections that um, when the whole system is done, we'll be able to cover. 70% of your typical need for water by just recycling rainwater. The point I want to make about the water gardens is they're not um, just copied out a, a rain garden uh, plant list or a kind of native plants of New York State. These are each a cell, each cell is different and they're called water gardens, just like the General Mills Prairie is called a fairy garden. There's a contrivance to them. There's probably even some introduced species in them. There's a kind of a, a set, there's a set of um, experiences that are um, intended that are, first of all, given variety and a, and a, a, a lot of difference in the seasons and difference over time. And it's not, in other words, designed by an ecologist. Is it designed by somebody or a group of people with ecological understanding, yes, but it's not a textbook wetland. This is a more recent picture looking back at the book and very This just gives you a sense of the hedgerows and how they stitch the park together and the lawns that they preserve for activities like 
oh, 8,000 people watching the movie, like this. Uh, other, I remember I told you about manipulating the edge, um, uh, grading, uh, inviting water into the site. One of the opportunities we got was to make a place where the salt water was introduced into the site to make a salt wash here. And this is by grading it um, and making the new stabilized edge here, removing this set, which you can see happening in this picture. And this is the salt marsh head, which is Spartina, one of the two species of Spartina that is actually adapted to grow in brackish condition. This is earlier in this uh, red one that was out. And then I'll just talk about one other concept with planting, which is the idea of kind of infusion of planting into place spaces in order to, in, in order to kind of um, increase the, uh, the complexity, increase the uh, imaginative the, the potential, but also increase the density that you can have of different kinds of place spaces in close juxtaposition to each other. And this is a uh, uh, nearly three acre play garden, as we call it, that, that's at the entrance to Brooklyn Bridge Park. And um, not to sound too much like bragging, I have to tell you that it was voted in Time Out Magazine the best playground in New York City. That was the thing that was that. And a popular magazine, too, not Lance the Park, but Magazine. Time Out Magazine. There we go. So, um, just, uh, this is a garden where there are different, it's really conceived of as a garden of different rooms with different horticultural expressions that then accommodate different kinds of play experiences. This is a garden of swings. This is a water play area. Um, this is a, uh, a, a sandbox village area that has a totally different horticultural expression. This is, um, uh, for older kids, it's called, uh, again, a different expression. So this is the, 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 the swing garden. Another piece in there. You can see there's a lot of uh, hydrangea. My thought was, why don't we put flowers that people have at their summer houses? Because in the park, the people that don't have summer houses. Um, and this idea film. And then this is the water play area, which is kind of more like a primitive uh, dinosaur scape of, of uh, Metasequoia and Sumac and pine trees. You can see how these, these spaces are ridiculously close to each other, but the planting really allows them to exist in close proximity. This is a, a marsh garden, which is for the misanthropes, like me. My client's upset because there isn't the same level of activity in here as there is in here. And I'm trying to tell her that there's not supposed to be. But in New York, we always, we always judge everything by whether you have a wait in line to get it in or not. <laughs> but you don't have to deal with that. Uh, and then the mountain, Sly Mountain is all um, defined by bamboo and uh, catalpa trees. And it creates these kind of jungle-like, a jungle-like setting. Like that. And with that, I will stop mostly and uh, take any questions you could muster.
Well, one of my, one of my favorite lines, well, most of my favorite lines that I call my favorite lines now no longer use it, so. Uh, but one of his favorite lines about landscapes versus architecture, and he says that on the day of the opening, the architecture will never look that good ever again. And the landscape, hopefully, will continue to look better because it will look like a wet dog on the day. Right? And, uh, and so when clients understand that you're really thinking about that and, and you're talking about it through the lens of the practicality of it and the care of it and also the satisfactory nature of it from the you know, opening day on, um, they appreciate that. They actually have a hard time thinking about it, though. Clients, you think that architect, you know, they think your designer is more focused on, you know, opening day. It's nothing compared to the client. It's such a giant project for the client that just getting the opening day seems like they you want to race. And the worst news you have to tell them is that they just are going to begin the race. That's it. And uh, I'm working on a project. Uh, a massive park in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now, which is going to have a five-acre playground, play garden, which the client says needs to be the best in the country. And all I do is focus on opening day and telling them how many things are going to be going wrong on opening day, how many kids are going to be stuck in something, and what's going to break, and you know, what's going to fail and all of that kind of stuff. And you try to pretend that you appreciate you telling me that. Really hard. Because you so focus on getting those construction documents done, and you're so focused on the monumental effort of getting the contract to do what you want, that you can't imagine that there's more to it. But a landscape is a living thing, and it's really just the beginning of it is getting to that point. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, well, the public has become conscious of changing water levels uh, because of Superstorm Sandy and all the news about it and, you know, people being flooded out of their houses and crying on television and whatnot, right? Um, but, I think you all know that the oceans have been rising since before Super Soul. The oceans have been rising since the last ice age. Okay? That's a lot earlier than Super Soul Sandy. And they've been more or less rising at the same rate. Okay? So, from my perspective, I already knew that. Okay? Now, everybody thinks we somehow anticipated Super Sargani, we made Brooklyn Bridge Park so resilient and it survived it because you somehow were prescient and you understood that it was coming. No, we just understood that it was on the shore and the ocean has been rising since the last ice age, basically. And so, as you could see in those cross sections, one of the most basic ideas was to do what? Pick it all up. Pick it all up. Um, and um, and that is, and, 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 and you kind of forget, you get in, a, you, got a, you kind of get going and you get excited about things, or you have, you have circumstances that seem to make that very difficult, like this park needed to match all of the existing roads, which you can't raise, although I wanted to, you can't go and raise all the existing roads around the park. And so, you know, uh, you start and you start thinking about the experience and what you're going to see, and you all of a sudden you start designing something that has nothing to do with raising it up. And it actually happened that I was in the shower one morning, in the middle of the end of construction documents, or the middle of construction documents, and I realized that we needed to raise every root ball of every tree above the 100-year 
flow. Um, and so I went back to the office and I said, well, I was thinking in the shower, we need to raise all the root balls above the 100 year flood. And Paul Seck, who is the flood uh, poet, who graduated, by the way, uh, who is the project manager, and said, well, the grading plans are done, so we'll have to redo those. And he said, so we'll get going on it. And they did. Um, and it turned out to be possibly as smart as smart as we did. So that's the main thing. The other thing is we re replaced a lot of vertical cantilevers, if you will, structural elements that were meant for unloading ships like bulkheads and whatnot, with basically really dumb technology. Gravity wall construction, gigantic rocks piled on other gigantic rocks, and we go on top of some other gigantic rocks. Okay? Really dumb technology, not advanced technology. Uh, maybe knowledgeable use of dumb technology, but not high tech. Okay? And, uh, and I think that was a
you understand what I just said? That's actually really a big deal. Like trees, a sterile tree, can't extract nutrients from soil on its own. They co-evolved millions and millions of years ago with these organisms, which are, of course, more primitive and existed before they did. And what these microorganisms do is they create a symbiotic relationship with plants, basically making the nutrients of the soil available to them in soluble form, essentially. And what we now understand is when you put high concentrations of salt fertilizers, which is what sort of fertilizers are, the concentrated salt, you kill those things in the soil. And then the salts, which are highly dissolved, soluble, where do they all go? Down, in a way, wash right away. And then what do you have? You have a depleted microorganism colony and no nutrients, right? And then what do you need to do? Buy more miracle growth, right? And you put it on like every week, which is good for miracle growth, but not so good for the soil biology um, of the soil. So, uh, and then what we understand now is that there's basically a kind of, um, a kind of uh, a proportion of the microorganisms of one type that is adapted to uh, grasslands, or grass uh, formations of most of grass-oriented landscapes. And then there's a different set of microorganisms, or a different proportion, that is uh, adapted to woodlands. So woodlands have a, more, a higher proportion of fungal component, and grasslands have a higher proportion of bacterial component, okay? And so, so when we try to grow trees in grass at Harvard Yard, we're actually mixing the two up together, aren't we? Like our whole idea of park is a confusion of soil biology, isn't it? Of course you can get it to work anyway, but um, it's, uh, and, and you can actually modify soil biologies row for row in your garden by changing the different um, feedstocks that you give the organisms, the different kinds of compost, say, for instance, that you give. So I think um, that understanding those, um, that, that, that bi biological component, which is, of course, in, in, in big conflict with soil compaction, um, salt, uh, uh, heat iron effect, and all of those kinds of things, understanding those things, um, and it really starts to give you, uh, you know, uh, the grounding for how to make a, a, an organically maintained park, which Teardrop is 100% organically maintained. Brooklyn Bridge Park is designed to be organically maintained. I'm not actually sure if they use an organic regime or not. I think they do. Um, and, uh, and, and the most essential element to making an organically maintained landscape is to have the right soil. If you don't have the right soil, you're always going to need chemicals to keep it down. Uh, always. You need fung you know, fungicides because it's only got the proper drainage. You'll need, uh, you know, plants that are in stress are the plants that are susceptible to pests and disease. Is that good? Is that good? Yes. So then, you said you're not sure that the Brooklyn Bridge Park is maintained organically. Are you creating maintenance programs yes. for every part of Yes. And, and, and there was a question, the question before was a little bit related to that. So, you know, how do you tell your client about it? What do you get them to do? What control do you have? It's different for everybody. It's totally different for everybody. Uh, you know, if you have a highly experienced client, you can engage with them one way. If you have an unexperienced but ambitious client, you can engage with them another way. If you have an unexperienced and unambitious client, then you get a new client. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very different, you know. People have different levels of capacity at different stages in their lives, too. And so if you can set up a process of education, that's also good. But for instance, on Carnegie Mellon, where there's like a million different microenvironments and you know all these different plant communities, we made a, a whole maintenance, a whole maintenance uh, matrix to take care of all of the parts of it, with like specific instructions. For instance, there's 
a poplar grove, a trembling aspen grove as part of that thing. And you might know about trembling aspen a little bit like sumac, like you're running upstairs. We were cutting down the sumac, we were coppicing the sumac. Well, trembling aspen kind of loses its vigor after 30 years or maybe sooner than next year, sort of like we put in it. And so in the maintenance manual, it says to cut down and remove the um, trembling aspen when the, when the bark begins to fissure. And that will cause root sprouts, which I'm sure will have already started to sprout, to start to sprout more vigorously and kind of replace it with a new, new set of vigorous growing poplars, which is what everybody wants to see. Nice, healthy, young, pretty poplars, right? And, and so there's, you know, that's in there. And there's everything that we can think of is in there. Um, you know, so we probably covered about half of what we need. <laughs> yes? So I'm curious about, um, so we're talking about succession ecologies and how you had a major change to remove certain plants from these succession ecologies. It seems almost counterintuitive because succession ecologies are kind of evolved to be these sort of traditional kind of old ecologies. So how, how much do these designers think about mechanisms for removing that sort of dictatorial maintenance strategy from the does that make sense to the question? Uh, are there mechanisms designed to in, 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 uh, impart succession ecologies which do not mean anti-genic impact or just to remove them from the same? Well, well successional ecologies are, 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 are succession. Right. You know, they, they are based on um, uh, rapid growth, right? And, um, and uh, a kind of radical transformation of the micro microecology or the, uh, the microclimate of the soil surface, basically. And so they act like a nurse crop for things that would like to grow in a more protected site, right? So your, your old field plants are basically a nurse crop for your oaks and beaches, right? Um, and so, uh, they will flag. Some of them just don't have the genetic juice to keep going, like as we can see with the sumac. You know, you need to cut down the old ones and just keep having those vigorous new ones come up. And then others are just going to be, they modify the environment to the degree that they, they themselves don't like it anymore. You see that gray birch do that all the time. They just sprout up and then they start shaking themselves out. Uh, so that's another one of those. Um, so I think, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think it, it's, 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 it's very much informed by an understanding of the ecology of the environment that you're, you're deriving your idea from, right? You have to have a real basic understanding of that. And the thing I tell my students, it's really about the soil surface. It's really about what's going on right at the ground level, certainly below the canopy level, but right we're right at the ground level, and if anyone has ever, you know, grown things from seed, you know how particular different seeds are for the different kinds of seed beds that they want. And you know, you, you can't take rhododendron seed and plant it in the same medium that you plant tomatoes in, because it's so small, you just wash right through this medium, and then you realize that rhododendrons actually germinate in moss, and, and that's because the moss has tiny little cup-shaped leaves that hold these tiny little microscopic seeds and then and mosses, you know, like to grow in acid soils and so the rhododendrons in the field will kind of grow together. So you have to understand it at that level, I think. Um, and uh, 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 William Kalina, uh, uh, who's written several books um, on that kind of relationship of plants um, uh, where he's really understood the kind of even in the, the relationship between different organisms and the germination of seeds. For instance, he worked, he was the head, head uh, uh, I think horticulturalist for the New England Wildflower Society. And, uh, you know, for instance, he discovered that there were ants involved in the, in the germination of, uh, of uh, trillium, which everybody just collects out of the woods because they couldn't figure out how to grow it. Then you figure it out how ants collect leaves and then they bring the trillium seeds in and they basically wind up being trillium farmers 
uh, and that kind of 